staying on topic of uh, robotic uh, microsurgical vasectomy reversals, I was just going to update um, our experience from uh, our center in Austin. So thank you guys very much for, um, for joining us for this discussion today. So obviously what we're talking about is uh, the choice of using a microscope versus a robotics for microsurgery. And obviously I think a lot of us are of the same mindset here uh, with these discussions. So about in the United States, there's about half a million vasectomies that are performed every year. And somewhere about 6% of those men within 10 years of their, rever of their vasectomy change their mind and decide they want to have more children. So if you think 6% doesn't sound like very many, that's actually 30,000 men out of that group. So it's a lot of guys. With a greater than 50% divorce rate in the US that uh, tends to, to lend to a lot of vasectomy reversals. So the first microsurgical vasectomy reversal was performed in the early 1970s um, using microsurgical techniques and that really improved the outcomes. Because depending on the portion of the vas deferens, whether we're working on the straight where we all like to do the repairs, versus the more challenging ones in the convoluted vas deferens we're talking about somewhere between a 0.7 and a 0.4 millimeter lumen. And then when we go to vaso epididymostomies, we're talking about a tenth of that size of that lumen. So very high levels of microsurgery. The uh, factors that impact our outcomes, number one is quite frankly, how good are we at them as surgeons? As surgeons, our level of training and experience, and I would echo what uh, Dr. Debo Card and what uh, Dr. Selber have already said, which uh, microsurgical training and tissue handling and um, minimal touch techniques are crucial. So we want to make sure that uh, we're, especially with the advent of robotic microsurgery and the progression of it, that we're giving it a fair chance and not having poor outcomes by surgeons that maybe don't do as much microsurgery, just jumping on a robot and trying it because the technique should be the same as a microsurgical technique, just using this advanced tool. Um, the appearance of the fluid and whether there's sperm in the uh, basal fluid is also crucial to know where to make the anastomosis. So these are uh, what we're talking about, of course, is the promise of robotics and microsurgery, which is why we're all here. And at present, the uh, standard that we're using is the Da Vinci system, although obviously I think we're all pleased to know that there are competitors that are up and coming with uh, hopefully more, uh, more uh, agile and lighter and, uh, and less expensive devices. So we all know the components of the, uh, the Da Vinci and historically how that's come about. So as far as vasectomy reversal, there have been a number of publications now on robot-assisted vasectomy reversal. Um, in 2004, there was the ex vivo robot assisted vasovasostomy that showed elimination of tremor and comparable patency rates. Again, in 2004, there was a robot assisted vasovasostomy and vasoepididymostomy in a rat model, which again uh, demonstrated improved stability and motion reduction during, uh, during suturing. In 2005, there was a multi layered robot assisted vasovasostomy in a rabbit model, and then Dr. Caracato published the first uh, human study. Uh, showing uh, shorter operative times, higher mean sperm counts in his, uh, in his experience in 2010. I published a, a validation study in 2014 showing that I had equivalent operative, time, operative times between my microsurgical and robot assisted techniques. Um, the patency rates, my raw numbers were higher um, in that series for my robot assisted group, but they were not statistically significant difference. And we happen to have a mean uh, time to pregnancy that was faster in our robotic group by about four months in these patients. So I think the concept of uh, good isn't good enough, so we're all familiar with uh, Steve Jobs pushing the envelopes as far as technology, and as our uh, robotic um, industry tends to push that uh, envelope, we need to be uh, there alongside with them to make sure we're using it in a manner that's optimal for our patients and, and hopefully will improve outcomes and minimize costs. So some of the advantages of robotic microsurgery, I think most of us are familiar with these, but we're getting elimination of tremor, improved stability. The seven degrees of freedom minimize the limitations of movement, make it a more fluid operation for us. Surgeon ergonomics, decrease surgeon fatigue. I think this one is crucial for me. If I do three to four micro cases in a day, my body's pretty beat up. I'm pretty worn out by the end of that day, um, where I can sit at the robot all day long and feel pretty fresh. Scalability of motion is obviously a very nice feature. The 3 def 3D high definition visualization, being able to manipulate three surgical instruments and a camera simultaneously and having complete control of that operation, I think is a crucial component. And there is a de-emphasis on specialty skilled micro assistance. If you're working around a one millimeter artery, you're trying to preserve, 
you don't want anybody else that isn't very well uh, suited to be in that field fumbling around there. And in private practice, you don't always get the same assistant. So that makes it, it nice to give me uh, the full control of that. Um, unchanged surgical field, if you're doing a higher level repair like a vasoheptidomostomy and you get to a level of, of frustration, you can back out of that robotic console, take a breath, pop right back in, and nothing in your field has changed. Where in a microscopic setting, when you do that and come back in, you have to reset everything, reestablish your baseline again. And operative time, which there is a learning curve, which we'll discuss here. So I typically use the nine of suture that uh, we were discussing, nylon is, is typically what I would use. Um, and this is, is just a demonstration in a, in a simulation model of you know, how limited we are in microsurgical movements in a very small space versus um, some of the uh, advantages you can get with a robotic microsurgical movements in that same limited space and the, the level of agility that that gives you. And so in that same simulation type model, again, you, you can certainly get the job done. We've proven that for years, but it, uh, it gives you some li limited uh, ability and, and not quite as fluid and meticulous of a nature. Where in our uh, robotic microsurgical suturing um, simulation, you can see the fluidity of it, the stability of the field, and uh, it's just it makes it a lot more of an elegant procedure when you're using um, robotics to help you with microsurgical techniques. That's, uh, I think we've all seen that demonstrated, but it, uh, it's just a very nice, elegant technique. So can you click the top left slide for me, please? So this is um, showing a, in the two uh, screens here, a visualization of a microsurgical vasectomy reversal vasovasostomy, along with a robotic one, and if you just toggle your eyes back and forth, it really demonstrates, I think, the stability of the field. and. Um, just again, how elegant and, and precise you can be. Not that you can't be precise microsurgically, but the stability of that field, and it's really physically an awful lot less taxing when you're trying to anastomose those um, lumens of this size. So this is um, my technique on the robot-assisted vasovasostomies, and I try to use a mini incision to do this, so I use about a one centimeter incision here which about 90% of my patients post-operatively tell me their experience and their recovery on their vasectomy reversal is very similar to their vasectomy experience, which is, uh, is nice because, you know, traditionally a lot of people will deliver the testes, nothing wrong with doing that, but you can actually do this through a pretty, pretty small incision and, uh, and isolate your vasectomy defects the majority of the time as long as they're not too low. Now, if we're doing a, a vasoeptomostomy, obviously we're talking about a different scenario where you're making a bigger incision, but you can see you can isolate both uh, vasa, and this is um, division of the testicular end of the vas deferens. And I just full quick decide that I'm not using so it doesn't confuse me if things get uh, lost. We take a little vasal fluid from the testicular end, make sure that we've isolated sperm, and uh, that we know we're in the right place to make our anastomosis. And we divide the abdominal end of the vas deferens and inject saline through it to demonstrate patency to make sure there's not a uh, upstream or downstream, I suppose, obstruction that would make you have to go a little farther up to, uh, to get your anastomosis. So you take a 25 gauge and your catheter and just inject saline through it. You know that there's no uh, pressure back up there. You're in a good place. I use the microspike um, um, vasal approximator of clamp to get the ends back together here. And then uh, really the portion I'm using the Da Vinci system for is the anastomosis, which I think is where it really gives me an advantage is, is uh, with luminal anastomoses. I use a one layer modified technique. So I'm putting 12 uh, sutures, these are nine uh, nylons transluminally, not 12 transluminally, I'm sorry, six transluminally, and then six in the seromuscular layers before, between those to give a um, tension-free anastomosis. And so this is nine, and I would echo what Dr. Demacard already mentioned, which is, you know, early on in my experience, I was breaking a ton of sutures, and then your brain feels like you learn that that haptic uh, feedback and that tactile feedback, where we all know you can't feel it, but uh, but you feel like you can. I just snap my my uh, stitches stitches here rather than cutting them with a with a uh, fourth arm. That allows me to use one less instrument. And I've gone to doing that, that does help from a cost standpoint too. That's one less replaceable instrument that we're having to use. So, hands together, pull apart. These are nine-no sutures. They can come apart very easily. And so, um, obviously, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show tying down every one of these knots, but 
you get the idea of placing uh, the transluminal sutures here. And then, um, so three go on this side, and then three will be placed in the ceramuscular layers between those. And then uh, the vas clamp is useful because your assistant at the bedside can just flip the clamp over for you, and now you can work on your posterior wall without uh, um, much effort there. You can see that we try to leave the um, basal adventitia intact so you maintain uh, microsurgical, uh, I'm sorry, microvasculature to the vas deferens, and that way it's going to minimize stricture rates. And these are the ceramuscular layer stitches that are being placed here. And then we'll flip over the vas and anastomose the uh, other side. And um, what I do in that uh, manner is I'll place the transluminal sutures without tying them down. So once we flip, um, I'll pass the three transluminal ones, just leave them in place, not tie them down so you're able to see your lumen and you're not compromising your visualization with uh, tying the anastomosis down. And then tie the three um, transluminal sutures and then uh, go ahead and put your, um, your adventitial ones, your uh, seromuscular ones in after that. So that's as simple as that. And that's about as much as I need my assistant to do during this operation besides handing sutures. And then you're gonna pass your uh, transluminal sutures and, and et cetera. I think that's frozen up over right here. Can you advance the slide for me, please? So, um, you know, again, I, I think this shows, demonstrates how we try to really use a minimal touch technique. And you see, we really don't try to touch the vast deference, don't try to touch the lumen very much. And you're just manipulating the needle and the uh, adventitia to get things approximated and get your anastomosis done in a, in a way that's going to be tension free. And so it's application of microsurgical principles just using this, uh, this different tool that's allowing us to have a little bit more of an element operation here. And, um, and then I've updated our uh, outcomes, which uh, hopefully we'll get up in a second, and we can talk a bit about the learning curve. My experience was that I was um, trained in my urology training um, at the time where we were transitioning from open surgery to robotic surgery, so really the Da Vinci started getting, and, and this just shows you how small you can make your incision for that uh, reversal. So this is a one centimeter or less incision here. Um, so this is the Gartner-Palmer Tech height curve. And this is basically applicable to anything in technology, whether we're talking about robotic microsurgery, the Tesla, the iPhone, whatever. So there's um, a technology tremor, and then there's an increase in visibility of that technology. And then we always have a peak of inflated expectations. This technology can do everything, and it can do it better than anything that's ever been. And then there's the trough of disillusionment where we go, ah, maybe it's not as great as we thought it was. There are some limitations. We have our slope of enlightenment and then our plateau of productivity. And I think we're heading onto our plateau of productivity as far as the robotic microsurgery platform goes. So as far as outcomes, hopefully we do a little better than this class here where 99% of the sperm cells are being told that they will fail. But uh, so this is my uh, microsurgical versus robotic um, microsurgical experience. And these are uh, patency rates and they're based on time frame since vasectomy. So we break this down because the farther out you get from the uh, vasectomy, the more increased pressure you get on the testicular end with potential scarring of the lumen and increasing risk of having to do more complex anastomoses like vasoepididymostomies. So we break that down in a zero to eight year um, time frame, and when we compare the microsurgical versus robot assisted, there was 93 and 96% patency rates. In the nine to 15 year um, mark, there were 94%, 97% the robot assisted. And it shows you the number of vasoepididymostomies that had to be performed during those time frames as well. Greater than 15 years tend to be more challenging cases. They tend to require um, higher levels of complexity. We usually get a lot more convoluted vas deferens anastomoses when we're talking about vasovasos and we're seeing more vasoepididymostomies. So in the microsurgical group, my um, patency rate was around 80% and the robot assisted was around 77%. And then overall patency rate, regardless of time frame, were 92% and 95%. And so you see that none of these um, were statistically significant differences between these two groups, showing that we're achieving um, equivalent uh, outcomes with robotic microsurgical techniques, and that's including the first series of cases that I did. That Looking at those same series of those two groups, the um, sperm concentration six weeks postoperatively were fairly similar, 29 million per milliliter and 25 million per milliliter. 
And again, there was not a statistically significant difference between those two groups in my patient population. As far as time, there were, I looked at mean operative times and I looked at mean anastomosis times because anastomosis is really where I'm using the robotic uh, platform, so I wanted to see where did we see a variation there. In the operative times, um, my microsurgical technique was still faster at 110 minutes versus 119 minutes, and that did show statistical significance. However, clinically, that means it's a nine minute difference, so as far as cost and operative time, that's pretty minuscule still. As far as mean anastomosis times, they're very similar, 60 and 63 minutes with no significant difference between the two. So how about the learning curve? Is this a challenge for us? Um, so I broke mine down into a set of four where I looked at my first 25 cases with the, ad, with the mean obstructive interval of nine years, standard deviation of six, and the range between the years of obstruction between two and 25 years, and there were two days of epididymostomies in that group. On my 26th to 50th case, also had an obstructive interval mean of nine years with standard deviation of six. That range went between three and 29 years, and there were two VEs. And my third group, cases uh, 51 to 75, the obstructive interval was a bit less, eight years, standard deviation of four, and my range on those uh, years was less as well, one to 15 years, and there were two VEs in that group as well. And then cases 76 to 94, haven't quite got to that 100 yet, the obstructive interval was uh, 10 years with standard deviation of five with a range of three to 23 years with two VEs. So pain to rates were very similar across the board regardless of the number of cases or where I was in my experience, 96%, 92%, 92%, 95%. Operative time um, did decrease overall as the trend, 122 minutes, 121, 115, 118. There was not statistical uh, significant difference between those. The anastomosis time tended to decrease as well, 75, 63, 56, and 57 minutes. And that did show statistical significant difference there. So we're seeing faster anastomosis time, which is where the robot is, is playing a role. And you can see the sperm concentrations there, not a statistical significant difference there. So what's next? Overcoming some of the challenges, improving microsurgical instrumentation for robotics, optimizing the platform, improving magnification, and decreasing pixelation. Um, as we're evolving, again, we're starting with microsurgery, just using the naked eye with fairly poor outcomes, advancing to using loops with still moderate to mild to poor outcomes. The big advancement was going up to the operative microscope where we saw massively improved outcomes, and now we're showing equivalents using robotics. Thank you very much.